you everybody for attending this masterclass on design thinking. I think it's going to be an interesting discussion. We've got a, a, a very experienced and well-known uh, guest speaker who's going to be presenting uh, on the subject matter. And we've also got two uh, South African-based uh, entrepreneurs and experts on design thinking and innovation as part of our panel for discussion just after the, uh, the presentation is completed. So uh, um, I think we've got about uh, 80 people signed in at this stage. So just, if, if we can start, I think we can. So the session will be recorded and we will make the recording available to uh, anybody who would like to request it afterwards. So yeah, with that, I think let's kick off. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself first. My name is Charles Bolton. I am the regional director for the Watwani Foundation for Southern Africa. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody, all our panelists, our presenter, but most importantly, our students and entrepreneurs from around uh, various regions of the world attending today. Um, thank you for putting the time aside to, to, to be with us. Um, I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Kaustu Dalgalkar. I hope I pronounced the surname correctly. Uh, yes. So, uh, <laughs> Kaustu is an expert and uh, um, innovator and uh, entrepreneur himself, but most importantly, he's an author on the subject of uh, design thinking. He's also a consultant to various organizations uh, in within the academic space and the corporate space on design thinking and innovation. Uh, he's a world-renowned uh, expert on the subject matter. Um, he's also an academic himself. And uh, with that, I think um, I'm going to hand over uh, to uh, um, Kastu to begin with. But uh, before we start off, I would just like to welcome now two panelists as well. We've got two uh, experts from our South African region attending today as well. Um, we've got Zanele. Uh, Zanele is an expert herself, Zanele Njapa. She's an expert on uh, innovation. She's also a consultant and author, but most importantly, an entrepreneur as well. Um, on the subject of design thinking, she's applied that and she consults with a number of large organizations and uh, within the region. But she's also a well renowned speaker on the subject matter and an author as well. So we've got, uh, you know, some uh, very well accomplished local expertise on board as well. And then we've got Jennifer Sutherland. Uh, Jennifer is also an expert on innovation. Uh, she's an entrepreneur herself. Um, she consults with large organizations on innovation and design thinking and uh, a very much uh, an expert in her own right as well. So welcome to Jennifer and Zanelli. And we're going to get them on board into the discussion just uh, after um, Kaustub's completed his uh, presentation and his talk on the subject. So uh, welcome, everybody. I hope you enjoyed. I think this is going to be a very relaxed uh, discussion. And uh, hopefully uh, our entrepreneurs will please ask us questions, send the questions via the Q&A. Uh, we will uh, revert the questions to the panelists and the uh, speakers. Uh, as soon as the panel starts and then uh, we will get some answers from them. So please send your questions via the Q&A and uh, I will revert the two of them after the session. So Kostu, thank you very much and with that over to you. All right. Uh, first of all, a big thank you uh, Adwani Foundation uh, Southern Africa for inviting us over. Uh, thank you Charles, thank you Komsa for uh, the generous introduction. Uh, can I uh, get to share my screen, please? I have a deck to share. So, yeah. Okay, is it visible, my screen, to everybody? Yes, it is, thanks. Okay, so yeah. So, <clears throat> broadly, I'm gonna take maybe about <clears throat> 17 to 20 minutes, totally. Uh, basically talking about the concept of design thinking and its applications with real examples. So let's keep the theory out and let's get into actual practical examples. So uh, without uh, going too much into the theoretical part, just to give an introduction, so to say, 
uh, about what is design thinking. Uh, it is a highly user-centric, exploratory, and iterative approach to problem solving. What it means is that it keeps the user at the center throughout the problem solving process, right from understanding the problem to defining the problem, to be able to generate ideas around the rightly defined problem, because many a times we define the problem from our perspective, but the user defines that same problem from a completely different perspective. And it is extremely important for us to understand that user's perspective. Hence, uh, the keeping the user at the center throughout the problem solving exercise or the process is extremely important. So right from understanding to definition of the problem to even generating ideas along with the user, getting feedback to prototyping the kind of idea at a low resolution level, then getting feedback iterating the prototype, refining the prototype, and then going towards a high resolution prototype before really launching the product or service. So it's highly user-centric, exploratory, and iterative. Now, uh, having said that, uh, why does it uh, help a corporate or an entrepreneur? First reason, because it's deeply user-centric. What happens is that it enhances the probability of innovation to happen because you're keeping the user at the center at all times. So you're understanding the, getting under the skin of that user and you're understanding what he or she really wants, what are the choices and preferences of that user and your offering constantly evolves along with that. Hence the probability of making innovation happen, both happens, goes up because of this approach of design thinking. And at the same time, because you're keeping the user at the center at all times, the risk of obsolescence also goes down because you are absolutely in touch with the user. So what are the possible obsolescence features get quickly realized by you and you can tweak your product service offering accordingly. And the third point is uh, it shows path when it is always day one. Uh, by day one, what I mean is that uh, when the universe got created on the first day, there was no precedent, right? So everything was happening new. There, was, there were no preceding earlier ways or SOPs, standard operating procedures to solve the upcoming problems. So, and in today's times, the same applies to whether it's business, society or technology tre trends. It's a, it's a very volatile, uncertain, complex, and an ambiguous world. In typical American military parlance, it is called VUCA. Volatile, uh, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And in this kind of a situation, how do you solve problems which have had no precedence? So design thinking with its extreme focus on the user, on the end user, shows you the way because you are constantly in touch with the choices, preferences, latent and unarticulated, so to say, needs of the user. Because you are evolving your idea, your product, service, etc., along with the user. Having said that, uh, let's uh, get down to what really differentiates design thinking from other problem solving approaches. According to me, that first part of empathy or deep engagement with the user, really to be able to put yourselves in the shoes of the user, that deep empathy is really what uh, differentiates design thinking from other problem solving approaches. The rest of the ideation, prototyping, etc., is a part of agile, DevOps, etc., etc., etc. But that empathy piece, the understanding the user piece in, in extremely, uh, extreme, uh, what do you say, consonance with the uh, user, is what really differentiates design thinking from other problem solving approaches. Hence, deep empathy leading to human centricity and understanding users in the context. So what I call as uh, the phrase as last mile user connect, uh, which means understanding the user in the context. Now, without really getting into theoretical definitions of all this and bringing jargon here, let's take some examples. Uh, to understand last mile user connect, let us see what happens without last mile user connect. What happens without last mile user connect, I repeat. Uh, now, this is a 
wide screen plasma screen televisions the way they were launched right in the early part of or the late 90s or early parts of 2000 the first company to launch these flat screen TVs were was Sony and Philips but they didn't really market it that big uh, sharp electronics was the company which marketed this product in a really big way and back then uh, these kinds of blockbuster launches used to happen in the US first then in Europe and then all over the world. Today, these launches happen simultaneously across the world. So this product was launched, uh, I think in the year of 2000 or 2001 uh, on what is called as Black Friday. Black Friday is the Friday after Thanksgiving Thursday, which is invariably the second last uh, Friday of uh, November. That's when the Christmas pre-New Year sales open up across the Western Hemisphere. And uh, these kinds of blockbuster home appliance called home electronics products generally get launched along at that time because a lot of purchasing happens. And uh, Sharp had launched this in, uh, collaboration, in, in uh, collaboration with the most proliferated chain of home electronics in the US, that is Best Buy Electronics. And uh, normally the agreement between the manufacturer and the retailer is such that if at the end of the sale period, if there is any unsold stock, then it would be taken back by the manufacturer or a debit note will be raised against the retailer, uh, which means the onus of sale is on the, on the manufacturer, not on the retailer, which means uh, the onus of sale in this agreement between Sharp and Best Buy would be on Sharp, not on Best Buy. Now, Sharp with uh, saying that this product is so much superior to the existing cathode ray tube televisions which existed back then. Product being so superior, Sharp was very sure that this product will just fly off the shelves. And after having showed a demonstration of these products, uh, of this product to Best Buy Electronics, Best Buy Electronics also felt that in fact, the, there won't be, we won't be in a position where there will be unsold stock, but we will be in a, probably in a position where we'll have to reorder even during the sale period because the demand will be high. And with this kind of an understanding, Sharp pushed the reverse kind of a deal with Best Buy saying that any unsold stock will be to Best Buy's account, not to Sharp's account. This was probably one of the first times in retail history that this kind of a reverse deal was signed, maybe 20, 21 years back. And uh, the whole uh, sale began on Black Friday 2000 or somewhere around that time. Uh, and uh, thinking that this product will really fly off the shelves. Uh, it was launched with a lot of pomp and show. And uh, three weeks into the sale period, hardly any inventory was sold. Best Buy was really under tension that this product which we had anticipated would really fly off the shelves is not selling barely five, six percent of their inventory was sold. And then uh, obviously there was pressure from the senior management at Best Buy. So instructions came from the CEO that uh, to all store managers across the country that please check out in your catchment areas. Catchment area is about a 20 mile radius, so to say around the store. Uh, instruct instructions came from the CEO down to all store managers saying that in your catchment areas, please check with people why they are not buying such a superior product because this was way, way superior than what existed back then. It was superior in terms of looks. It was better designed in terms of internal electronics. It was better designed in terms of uh, better performance. Everything was so much better than the old cathode ray tube television. Uh, and very strict uh, instructions came from the CEO saying that you will not conduct these questionnaire surveys at your stores, but you will send small teams of people from the store to people's houses in your catchment area to understand why these people are not buying such a, such a, such a good product, uh, such a superior product. Uh, these uh, store managers must have sent out their teams for the next four or five days in their catchment area. That means each store manager probably did about 15 to 20 home visits through his uh, staff. So uh, they had around 90 stores across the US back then, uh, Best Buy Electronics. So they must have made around 1500 to 1800 home visits. 
and uh, the major reason why people were not buying such a superior product uh, when i tell you you will find it extremely silly why they were not buying this superior product you know back in the late 90s early 2000s televisions had probably not invaded our bedrooms they used to be generally in the drawing rooms and uh, uh, and where in the drawing room there used to be like one big showcase kind of a storage unit a wall cabinet on one of the main walls and a television used to be kept at the center over there in a slot in that piece of furniture now what happened was that slot in that piece of furniture used to be square in shape according to the old old kind of television which was the cathode ray tube tv which used to be square in shape and this was a flat screen rectangular tv which meant that uh, this people were not able to fit in this new tv into that old furniture of theirs and obviously people were not going to spend probably 40 50 thousand dollars changing the wall cabinet to accommodate a probably four to five thousand dollar tv now this is what i mean by lack of last mile user connect a beautifully designed product a fantastically performing product but not understanding the context where it is going to be used which is what i mean by lack of last mile user connect now that i have kind of spoken about what happens without last mile user connect let us look at what happens with last mile user connect all right this is an example i'm going to take up one of my students uh, from mumbai uh, this guy in his college was doing some automation uh, project and kind of stumbled, uh, this is about six, seven years back, and stumbled along uh, uh, a use case, an application where uh, he, he created a, a controller through his mobile phone, which could help farmers manage their pumps, you know, switch them on and off, a simple operation to begin with. Uh, then uh, he went and actually stayed with some farmers, uh, a city bred guy, spent about six, seven months going, going around the countryside to understand their issues and came back with some very deep understandings and then got into, you know, now he is enabling water conservation for farmers. He has created a software platform. He has created a cloud platform to enable power consumption and optimal power consumption for these guys. And now he has partnered with various state governments in the country, in India, on a platform that enables the government to monitor the kinds of subsidies that are given to these farmers. Because in India, water and electricity is kind of free for farmers because agriculturists generally come from the bottom of the pyramid and a lot of subsidies are given by the government. But many times these subsidies are kind of misplaced no monitoring happens. People consume water the way they want to consume, etc., etc. So there is no real control. So now this guy has partnered with the governments, various state governments, and is getting extreme traction. And uh, now he is talking. And he started with a small little piece of hardware, and now that hardware still stays, but he has become a cloud platform where he now collaborates with soil health uh, detection sensors countries i mean uh, companies into soil health monitoring and that helps the government create soil health cards and accordingly advice comes from the government for the kind of crops to be sown in specific farms even the same farmer with different land geographies is kind of advised in this piece of land maybe you can plant this crop in this piece of land you can plant this crop now this is a six seven year journey which this boy has taken and from a piece of small piece of hardware with one specific use case he has now transformed this company from into a complete cloud platform where other service providers also can log in and uh, it's it's if everything goes well this guy in the next two, three years should be able to capture at least about 10 states in the country in, in India. And that's what I mean by spending time last mile user connect, understanding all the problems. And that's where he was able to go beyond just that piece of hardware that he was making and transforming his company from a 
complete from pure hardware product provider to a to a service provider now service platform where a lot of other services can come in so he is not manufacturing the other hardware he is manufacturing only his piece but he has created a platform where other hardware manufacturers can plug in now that, that's what happens when you really spend time with your consumer and along the way uh, just uh, understand how many pivots so to say how many times he has changed his business model to suit what the consumer needs the best so that's how you kind of constantly create fit between user needs and your offering and that's what you really need to understand spending time with your consumers and that's where i believe that uh, the adage of user first and technology later uh remember this statement user first technology later i'm going to talk about uh, now now i've talked about a, a small manufacturer a startup growing growing to scale now i'm going to talk about a largish company a corporate company from my consulting experiences how that user first technology later approach can can enable some breakthrough ideas breakthrough solutions to come now i'm going to, this is about a you know almost uh, two and a half uh, three year old three years back this company uh, a typical telecalling bpo you know those uh, people who call us for trying to sell us a credit card or trying to sell us an automobile loan or a housing loan etc that kind of a telecalling company now this uh, these guys came to me saying that we want to really enhance the efficiencies of various processes in the company they had been on a digital transformation journey for the previous 5 uh, 7 years but still the efficiencies of certain processes were not to their satisfaction so then my first question was uh, let us start with the most inefficient process in the organization and they said uh, the logical answer was the most inefficient process is the telecalling process because our folks keep on calling prospects 5 times 10 times 15 times and the customers prospects feel pestered and it's a, it's a lot of waste of time money effort and all of that right so we want to really streamline this process and relook at the whole thing now uh, initially the thought was let's do a kind of a brainstorming design thinking come breakthrough kind of idea creation ideation workshop and initially they were saying that let's do it for the senior management and then we will trickle it down to down the hierarchy Uh, to which my point was if you want to really solve a problem then the whole entire team which is involved in that particular process needs to be there uh, after a few back and forths they agreed and then a team of about 19 people was set up right from the senior vice president to the general manager to the solution architect to the techies in the team and uh, on my insistence two telecallers who actually make calls were involved in that uh, whole exercise and we began uh, that workshop on day one my generally uh, what i do is in the first couple of hours i try to get the information from them what has happened what has worked for them what has not worked for them etc though we do a lot of ground work but I would like to hear it from the horse smart and in that process i noticed that these two telecallers hadn't opened their mouth at all in the first one and a half to two hours before the first coffee break so to say you know we started at about 9 o'clock and the first break we took at about 11 o'clock and uh, these guys had not these two folks had not opened their mouth at all so in that coffee break i just sat with them trying to chat them up and you know trying to understand their perspective after about uh, a couple of minutes they warmed up and one of them said that all this discussion that is happening in the first two hours in that room in the brainstorming room all that is fine Uh, because senior management was throwing a lot of uh, you know statistical details and we have done this and six sigma analysis and x y z etc etc et but he said that the moment i pick up my receiver and talk to a prospect and when i carry on a conversation when i make a call to a prospect in the first five to six sentences of hearing the prospect talking i kind of can judge the voice tone of that person and i kind of get a gut feeling that this call may convert may not convert this may need a little push how much of a push this will need etc etc now this was an extremely subjective kind of judgment from the telecaller's perspective and uh, this really interested me and i said let's talk about this so when we restarted the workshop after the coffee break 
uh, I made him explain, I made him talk, whatever he, he had spoken to me during the break. And uh, the, he spoke about that. And the moment he finished speaking, almost everybody pounced on him, throwing numbers at that guy, saying that, you know, we have 3,500 telecallers making 40 to 60 calls in an eight hour shift, which means 3,500 into say 50 calls, it's about 175,000 calls made per eight hour shift. And if we were to take the subjective judgment of each of these calls, it would be impossible for us to operate at scale. Absolutely valid uh, point there. Uh, now, still we kind of, you know, persisted with the discussion. And then uh, about 10, 12, maybe 15 minutes into the discussion, one of the techies in the group said that, what are you talking about? You're talking about judging the intent by voice tone. So basically you're talking about analyzing voice. Voice tone is basically a sound wave and sound wave has amplitude, sound wave has wavelength and sound waves have frequency. And these three are perfectly measurable, absolutely quantifiably measurable. And uh, we need to look at that perspective also. Then my next question was, uh, do you have old call log records which are recorded? Remember when these people call us, they always say this, uh, this call will be recorded for training and quality purposes, which means they do record certain calls. Uh, so the next question was, how many calls do you have recorded over the previous years of operation? Then immediately somebody was sent out to find that information. In two, three minutes, that guy came back saying that they had call logs, recorded call logs of 4.5 million calls made over the previous eight to 10 years of their operations. No, that's a huge data set. Now, uh, the question was, how do you understand the voice tone involved in each of these 4.5 million calls? And how do you correlate with the outcome? So then the next question was, are the outcomes of these 4 million calls also documented? They said, yes. Then it was a question of recognizing the pattern between the voice tone of 4.5 million call logs with the outcomes of these call logs. Now, internally, these guys did not have this kind of speech recognition technology capability, etc. So we started looking around and uh, we are, I'm connected with a few technology business incubators in the country, in India. And, uh, you know, we just looked around and we found one startup in the space of some cool speech recognition technology. And then these guys got together the startup and this company. And over the next about seven, seven and a half months, this the startup developed a voice recognition engine for these guys based on the a machine learning kind of an algorithm that they created based on the 4.5 million call logs correlated with the outcomes. So what came out was a voice recognition engine which kind of put the voices voice tone into five patterns. Voice tone pattern A corresponds to an outright conversion, outright yes from the prospect. Voice tone pattern D corresponds to a maybe yes from the prospect. Voice tone pattern C corresponds to a, to a fringe kind of a prospect. Maybe yes, maybe no, can be pushed either way. Voice tone pattern D corresponds to a maybe no and voice tone pattern E corresponds to an outright no from the prospect. Now, this is a self-learning algorithm which got created by the startup and now about, you know, just before this lockdown and all that has happened in February, I had checked with these, uh, with the BPO and it being a self-learning algorithm, they have now reached a stage where when a telecaller calls a prospect within the first 12 words that the prospect utters, that prospect's voice tone is analyzed by the backend's voice engine and is categorized into whether pattern A, B, C, D or E. And depending on which pattern that prospect's voice falls in, accordingly, that information is displayed on the telecaller screen. And the next appropriate conversation flow is kind of displayed on the telecaller scene, uh, telecaller screen, thus reducing a lot of unwanted conversation, reduce, creating absolutely pinpointed direct conversation with these guys, reducing time, money, effort, everything. Now, with this example, what I'm saying is even high tech solutions come when you put the user first. And if you really see 
the idea did not come from higher up in the hierarchy the idea the germ of the idea actually came from the person the telecaller who is in direct contact with the user every single working every single moment of his or her working time that's once again a classic case of having last mile user connect and keeping the user first and then looking for appropriate technologies to kind of satisfy those needs many times we make the mistake of starting with a technology that we are comfortable with and then trying to solve some problems and then we are trying to force fit our technology and expertise into the user's problem whereas design thinking which with its deep extremely high emphasis on the empathy part starts the problem solving exercise from a completely different perspective that is user first technology later so some salient point before i close user first technology later having a multidisciplinary approach uh, remember that team comprised of senior management folks it comprised solution architects it complied it, it comprised the techies and also the last mile user connect those telecallers because of that because the team being multidisciplinary the kind of the insight was very different many times we try to solve problems especially startups we just involve our friends from our college from the same department same branch of engineering or same branch of commerce or whatever it is we come together we don't take outside opinions that outside opinions are very important building on wild ideas initially this whole thing of voice voice tone recognition was kind of you know who pooed thinking that uh, it's a wild thing but gradually they looked at the encouraged experimentation and they created a thing and most importantly they were willing to co-create and collaborate with the ecosystem finding the right guys to be able to help many times we don't do that thinking that my as startups my idea will go out in the open and somebody will steal it but then um, it doesn't happen work like that when you are actually collaborating you are much much faster in the market much much uh, you know quick to the market and uh, you're always since you are in constant touch with the user you're always one or two steps ahead of the competition of course it might happen but uh, collaboration co creation all these things uh, uh, principles of design thinking i feel very strongly that in the startup ecosystem we really need to inculcate all of that with that i will stop here and uh, you know over to you charles uh, and uh, for the further conversation thank you kastub that was uh... That was very, very informative, and I think uh, our students uh, can relate to a lot of the uh, information and statements that you've made and the information that you shared. We've got a fairly long list of questions, but I think before we start with the Q and A session from the uh, attendees, uh, I would like from our panelists if they can perhaps uh, give us some input uh, or have some questions that they would like to ask you. So I would. Uh, Ask uh, um, perhaps let's start with uh, Jennifer and then uh, Zanelle your feedback. So Jennifer, over to you if you've got any questions for Kastu. Any feedback from your side? Response. Um, I really like the user first technology later as a as a kind of a principle because I don't think it's it's really specified and often startups go with the technology later or the technology first and user later. Like how can we put this in? Um, I was wondering how you got leadership buy-in into the BPO company to consider things a little bit differently because I think that's one of the key um, pillars of design thinking is the mindset and having the leadership with the right mindset is critical. Um, so I was wondering how you did that. Uh, you're asking me a question? Yeah, okay. Uh, see, initially there was resistance. You know, they quickly jumped to numbers, as I said. We have 3,500 tech callers making these, 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 and it's impossible to kind of get in subjective judgment of each one. But then it was tough, uh, but giving examples of certain things from the past consulting experience, showing them use cases where this happened, where uh, uh, even, uh, I mean, throwing open even failures also, throwing open uh, some situations where some ideas came up and that company did not act but the competitor acted on it so that way it kind of opened up uh, the conversation and uh, in this particular case the management was fairly open 
you know, it wasn't too much of a case of banging your head against a wall in this particular case. But in other cases, yes, it happens. So in that case, it's about uh, trying to visualize use cases. If this idea is not adopted, what might happen? And if this adopt if the idea is adopted, I think in my practice, that's what I've realized works. All right. I'll... Jennifer's, if Jennifer's all answered, then, then I'll go next. I think definitely I absolutely can resonate with that user first, take later. And it's a brilliant concept. And I think that I'd like to carry on with um, going forward. But another one that definitely stepped out for me was uh, your last mile user con connect. And, and that's really just such a, a trend that we see consistently with, with startups and, and even um, medium-sized organizations and even large organizations and corporates that I've worked with at this stage are now needing to come back to that. And, and what we want is not having to come back to that because we've uh, taken the, the wrong path, but we want to make sure that from the beginning, that's something that we touch base with. And before I ask you my question, I want to uh, speak about an example that actually came to mind when you, when you gave some of your, your absolutely lovely case studies was the story of Black & Decker, uh, which is a drill company that, and I, I know a lot of people will, and will know this case study possibly, where when they did research and they started to actually if, after having um, sold their drills for a while, they then started to do research to find out exactly how people were making use of their product. And they actually found that a Black & Decker drill in about its 10 year lifespan was actually only being used for about eight minutes in its entire lifespan. And so when they started to realize that insight, they had to then go back and say, okay, so actually what we're doing is we're investing in making our drills smarter. We're making them easier to handle all of these lovely innovations and shiny new toys that we're adding to make them more efficient only for them to only work for about eight minutes and then never work again. So what they started to then think about was, okay, maybe it's better if we, what are act people actually looking for in, in what we give them? So the question they started to ask was not what we are selling to our clients, but what are our clients doing with what we're selling them? And for me, that was an absolute game changer because once they started to ask that, it revealed to them that people just wanted holes. If you think about it, they just wanted that hole. And if they could sell the hole and not the drill, then it completely changes the game. So I just wanted to bring that example up. And then my question for you was, what have you started to notice, especially when it comes to that aspect of last mile user connect, that the organizations you're working with are, are missing? What are, what are they still missing after all of this time? Uh in large companies, what I see is that uh, decision making is kind of centralized up the hierarchy. So the last mile user connect comes from the sales guy who is in touch with the distributor, with the customer. And uh, I see that the information capturing capacity of organizations is not quite uh, proper, especially in, you know, these brick and mortar kind of old large companies, FMCG companies or FMCD companies, fast moving consumer durables or fast moving consumer goods, because they, they still come from that old mindset. Uh, so now, now it is changing with analytics coming in with, you know, portable uh, information feeding devices, either tabs or mobile phones where the sales guy can quickly capture that information and it is provided to decision makers soon enough. That's, that's changing. I mean, at least in India, I'm seeing that happening over the last seven, eight years. Uh, though Indian companies have been giving these solutions because of the IT expertise to a lo lot of overseas Western companies, but Indian companies were late to adopt that kind of a thing. So those platforms to capture that last mile uh, information and some, you know, formats in which this can become institutional intelligence, so to say, the company's intelligence engine, which can be accessible to all people across the hierarchies for decision making. That still, I feel, uh, is missing in some of the FMCG and, you know, even automobile companies, uh, etc. that I've worked with, I, I find that uh, missing. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. And Thank you, Kirst. the startups, of course, startups, many times we are just overawed with the technology that we've created that we think, oh, I have created the best possible technology. And the moment I enter the market, people are going to fall flat at my feet and going to buy, buy, buy my stuff. That's what, of course, that's the exuberance of youth. It helps also. But many times you kind of miss that last mind user connect. And what I've seen is the mistakes that you make when you roll out, your competition is quick to grab that and makes those corrections and your first mover advantage is somewhere gone. So in a lot of industries, I've noticed that the first movers are not the leaders. It is the third or the fourth entrant which has kind of taken over that industry. That's my observation. And I think it's an age old thing that's been happening. Look at HP, IBM, et cetera, et cetera. You know, those kinds of things. Anyway, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Kastup. Um, we've got a number of questions from the attendees. Um, first on, um, there's a question on, can you elaborate a little bit on the meaning of iterative processes? Iterative means it kind of goes in loops in the sense that uh, the design thinking process, because you keep the user at the center at all times, you are constantly taking feedback from the user and modifying bettering your product or service offering. So it's a lot of back and forth happening. So it's a lot of iterations happening. And it's good to do those iterations before the launch, rather than launching something and then, uh, you know, then not getting the traction in the market. So iterative is like going on in that loop. And then we've got another question here from uh, one of the attendees. Is, what are the important parameters to work on for a startup who has good subject knowledge, but less market and user experience? Uh, well, for you uh, to be successful as a startup, you need to satisfy some user need, right? So for which there is no option, but to have a good understanding of market and user experience. And if you are good at technology, then visualize certain use cases for the customer. Use cases means this is the customer pain. Will my technology work to solve this problem? If not, then please keep on understanding those users and identifying multiple use cases. If you identify maybe 10 use cases, you might be successful at creating some product or service for maybe two use cases, but that's how uh, you, you're going to be successful. There's no option to I, understanding the market and the user. Yeah. Um, can I add a little bit to that? Sure, sure. Yes, please. Yes, please. Jenna. Um, something like the value proposition canvas from strategizer might be quite useful in that, in evaluating this is my product and what it does versus this is my user who I imagine my user to be, what the pains are that they're struggling with, what are they trying to do in their lives, and how well do those two things match? Um, and they have some really great videos on, on doing that canvas, so it's a great way to evaluate what you have and whether it is actually satisfying the need. Yeah, I think um, that's a great input from your side, Jennifer, and because we've got a related question. Uh, what techniques or mechanisms uh, would you advise startup teams to adopt to really get a deeper understanding of the end users when designing a solution? Any feedback from your side on that, or is it still? I think we st it's very related I, I, to. I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're audible. Yeah, yeah. Now the question was, what techniques or mechanisms would you advise startup teams to adopt to really get a good and a deeper understanding of the end users when they're designing solutions? Would uh, Would you want to take it, either Zanel, Jennifer? I mean, you are. Any can we have any feedback from our panelists, Jennifer Zanelli? Um, well, talk to them. That's the easiest and cheapest and doesn't require a whole lot of training. Um, but also that document what you think your use, who you think your users are and then talk to them to validate whether that's true or not. Um, and then iterate, um, as Dr. Kastub said, um, your solution based on that. Now, there's Great. not too much to add, but I think Jennifer, you, you were you came across quite well. 
it's it, it is just a matter of actually going out there and getting and getting what what you need to and then another part of it is understanding what your and I don't want to call them competition, but individuals that are playing in your field are actually doing. There's no harm in actually understanding what your horizon looks like. And this is one of the big mistakes that we make is when we isolate ourselves in the systems in which we exist. Understand that there are big players uh, that you're coming into the market to and then understand what they are doing and how they're leveraging and how they've understood the market. Because if you're going to be serving the exact same market, it, it, it's easy or we can assume that some of those aspects and things about it are going to help you. And then the other thing I want to just encourage while we're still speaking about iteration, which I, I like, is that it's important to understand that we can get it wrong. And, and we do often, especially as entrepreneurs, but that's the process. It's, the, it's literally the process of getting things wrong. I read a quote yesterday that says, uh, running a startup is like eating glass. You start to, to enjoy the taste of your own blood. It was a bit graphic, but for me, it just hit home and I see my fellow panelists are, are smiling because that's what it is. You start to, you get into this mindset of consistently going and going and going. And an example that I like to give of this is when the Macintosh first launched, they thought it was going to be a spreadsheet data processing machine and that's how they put it out into the market. But lo and behold, when, when data came back, they found that actually desktop publishing was one of the biggest uh, drivers for, for consumers with, with the Macintosh. And so they had to change that. And for them, it wasn't that they were going to, to still use that as their main selling point, but they had to change it in response to that. So it's this consistent back and forth and back and forth and back and forth that you need to enjoy and actually start to make peace with. Can I, That's absolutely true. Can I, can I please add uh, to that some tools, if I could share the screen. Uh, uh, I'm going to display some. Can you see my PDF here, all of you? Yes. Yeah, uh, this IDEO is a company from Silicon Valley. Over their 40 years of practice, uh, they have kind of, you know, developed certain tools uh, which can be used for observation. You know, so uh, let's not spend time on this. Maybe this document could be sent across to the attendees. It'll be a useful thing. Uh, that is we ask concrete tools. And something that I rely on a lot is this user journey mapping, where uh, you understand what are the tasks that the user is going through to perform those tasks, what are the steps that they follow, and at each of these steps, what are the touch points, devices, interfaces that they come in contact with, and at each step, what is the pain, gain, emotions, experiences, feelings that they face. So maybe you could... Uh, you know, I can pass these documents across and uh, you can send it across to the attendees. I think, thank you, uh, Kasub. That would be great because we've had a number of uh, requests on that subject, you know, what tools are available for entrepreneurs to use uh, to develop their own design thinking processes within their businesses. Um, uh, so another question that's now popped up from a couple of people is why is design thinking not more widely included in the education system globally. Any response from our panelists and our presenter on that? <laughs> well, I can speak uh, from maybe the uh, Indian perspective. Uh, a little bit of education overseas abroad also, my exposure. Uh, what I feel is that, you know, uh, people want quick results people, a education system wants to be examining everybody on the same paradigm. Uh, now, when that happens, the whole concept of multiple choice questions comes into the picture because you want to automate evaluation. Now, if you encourage a student to explore, the student is not going to give you an A, B, C, D kind of an option, you know? So, and the prof or the teacher is not going to be able to evaluate him or her on a standardized scale. I think that's, that's, that's one of the key reasons why I feel, uh, uh, you know, uh, design thinking as a subject is given, but embedding design thinking into the other subjects is what needs to be done. Now this multiple choice questions, 
kind of a evaluation works for exact sciences yes because there are exact answers but not when there are subjects related to interpretation but unfortunately we want to automate evaluation uh, i think that's where this whole exploratory mindset kind of gets tossed out of the uh, out of the window that's that's my that's one point the others but this one i feel very strongly about jennifer any any feedback from your side on that on that question any input no i agree 100% i think it's the whole education system is not here at all same in south africa for um critical thinking and uh the, the teacher doesn't have all the right answers um and you've got to accept that you don't have all the right answers in design thinking so yeah the, the whole education system doesn't lend itself towards that zanelle anything so i love this question because i used to be a <laughs> primary school teacher so i know i know that so many of these public systems are not they're not wired for to to enhance creativity they're not wired for entrepreneurship and they probably won't be for a few years and that's what i always tell people don't worry about what the education system is doing or not doing worry about what you know it should be doing and try to make that work because even as a teacher in my own classroom i used to just work around what i've got and make sure that the way in which i teach what i infuse into my teaching is going to enhance some kind of out of the box or inside the box thinking that's that's creative and we approach things in different ways and 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 so this is the very big thing that i i think it's it's important to understand it's not going to catch up but it is about how we do it and how we start to approach it and actually make it work okay good uh we've got another question here what is more important um idea product first um so now the questions are rolling in here i have to keep track of them <laughs> let me just scroll back Sorry about that. I was reading questions and then all of a sudden the platform updated. Uh, so yeah, the question was, uh, what is more important, the idea, the product first, then survey and feedback, or first the survey and then plan the product? Any feedback from your side, Kostub, on that? Uh, well, I would look at it from two perspectives. Uh, as a startup, we always start with an idea. Yeah. uh but it is important to understand who are you going to sell that idea to and that's where your feedback from the user begins uh from a large corporate perspective uh it probably starts probably starts with the market because they have an established presence in various markets and they have reached to various customer segments so then they are looking for ideas to sell more of the same product or to sell some other product to the same customer set so the whole process starts from two different kind of poles for a startup and and a corporate uh, i'm going to focus talk about startups so we all start with most startups start with the pain that you already feel with an existing product or service or offering uh, and that's the, that, that that's the way we go about it and then how much open are you to explore the customer segments that come up in your under your idea under the domain in which you are trying to enter the market that that is important that open mindset and the willingness to really learn from the user is something very important and that's what designing design thinking really lays emphasis on and as i uh, as all of us uh, talked about various tools and those two templates which we talked about those are some very simple techniques which we can use to get a lot of insights which are unsaid by the end user unsaid being the real term because when you go to a customer with a ready questionnaire you, i don't think you really get you know real information you need to be able to develop the art and skill of trying to get to the unsaid things and that's what uh, some of these tools help Uh, any feedback from your side zanelli jennifer on that question the, the question was what is more important uh, idea product first uh, and then the survey feedback or the first do the survey and then plan the product 
I don't have much to add to uh, Dr. Castro, but, but I think um, corporates especially, but even an entrepreneur can, should constantly engage with their customers and their users because people change. You know, just because your customer wants X now doesn't mean in two, two years time or six months time, they, they want the same thing. So there's always that iterative, how can we make the product more relevant to who our customers are now, which is especially relevant now in, in, in these times is our customers under COVID are, have some quite different challenges and, and needs that they didn't have a year ago. Um, so how can we adapt to what we're doing based on that? Awesome. To add to what Jennifer was saying, it, it really matters very little which one comes first because, and, and this is the great thing uh, Dr. Kastub spoke about with the design thinking as a framework, because it's so fluid and can be, um, can be practiced in so many different ways, it allows you to go back and forth and back and forth. And there isn't necessarily a first step that's, that's set in stone. And this is the beautiful thing about the process is that you can go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth between each and every one. Obviously, you do want to consider what your investment would be if you develop a product that's not necessarily speaking to your market, then that's probably not a great idea. Uh, so it's that consideration of going through the process, but understanding that that process is, is consistently fluid. And based on the results that you've gotten from the phase that you're working in, that will then inform how you go forward. So there's no plan that needs to be set in stone, which I think is a, is a beautiful thing about, about design thinking overall. We've got an interesting question here, and I think uh, if we can get some feedback from each of you. Uh, the question is, what's the difference between design thinking and outcome-driven innovation? And which of the two, two is the better tool to use? So it's a two-part question. Um, Dr. Me? Okay. Yeah, please. Uh, I think uh, these are jargons which get thrown around to confuse people. Typically, Academicians use that target. Sorry to say that. <laughs> we, I am also part of academia. And many times we try to confuse people with a lot of theoretical conceptual frameworks, etc. Whereas the logic and the common sense is very simple. So I personally feel both, both are more or less the same. Outcome driven innovation is also talking about what outcome the user seeks from you, right? So it is, it is user focused. So let's not get into semantics unnecessarily, I feel. Let's keep it simple and logical. That's, what I've, that's why I've titled my book also, it's logical. So. Anything from our panelists, Zanele? All right, I love that. I would also say very much of the same thing. And it depends on what your outcome is. And, and with design thinking, there's, there are also outcomes, but they're very closely linked, uh, as Dr. Kasub said, to your, your, your client and, and your people. And then that's the central idea behind it. And there's a story that I like to tell, if you'll just allow me two seconds here, Charles, sure. is the, the story of the, the ice or the refrigeration industry. So if you go back a good few years, very, very first in the, in the refrigeration industry, we used to have our um, individuals who would go up to, to the north and cut up blocks of ice from ice ponds. And that's the way that they would get ice to different people's homes. So this is what they did. And any kind of innovation at this time was having possibly a sharper saw to cut the ice or a faster, stronger horse. That was innovation in that sense was limited to that. So you had to go up there to get that ice. And then a few years down the line, we had ice factories where now we could actually store our ice in, in places that are not necessarily up in the north. So we didn't need to sleep there uh, in order to actually get our product. So now there was that innovation in terms of cooling, et cetera, et cetera. And then a few years down the line, we had the refrigerator, which obviously then meant each and every individual had an almost ice box in their home. They didn't need to go up to the north. They didn't even need a saw. They didn't need a horse or a cart for that matter. And the interesting thing about this story is that none of the individuals or the innovators or the entrepreneurs from each of these phases of, of this um, innovation or this industry actually carried over to the next one. 
And I find that a very disheartening or sad story because it shows us that our view of the work we do as entrepreneurs is quite limited because we view ourselves in terms of what we give. This is what I do. I cut blocks of ice. Boom. And then what happens in 20 years time when no one wants you to cut blocks of ice? Then who are you as an entrepreneur? Who are you as an industry leader? So it's that, that shift that needs to happen. And I find that design thinking really starts to speak to this, to say, okay, what we are doing actually is we supply, we help people keep food cold. And so that in 30 years time, when keeping food cold doesn't look like cutting blocks of ice, we can still respond to that. We can still respond to our clients. We can still respond to our customer because we really understand what they want from us. But if we limit ourselves to, to just that, then we miss 20 years down the line, we find ourselves as another case study among Kodak and the rest because we've missed the boat. So I think that that's, that's definitely something I can build on on what's been said so far. Very well answered, I think, from our panelists. Thanks, Charles. That's a pleasure. Thanks, Annette. That's that, that was a great example, a real world example. I think that's really what uh, we need to offer entrepreneurs and students are real world examples of how design thinking has changed the world and changed the way we live. And, you know, if, even in our everyday sort of lives, where does this come from? So uh, we've got one Hi, or two more questions. Can I add a caveat there, please? Yes, please, Jennifer. Sorry, my apologies for not uh, no, it's cool. <laughs> referring to you. Um, <laughs> one thing that I'm very um, obstinate about is that there, there isn't only one methodology that's right. So when you say what's the better tool, it's always contextual. Um, people are always talking about service design or journey mapping or customer experience or uh, lean startup or innovation. You can mix and match these things depending on what you're trying to solve. So don't get too dogmatically stuck on design thinking and design thinking's process. Adopt the principles of all of those and then find the right way to solve the problem that you're trying to solve rather than sticking to the, well, this is what the design thinking rules say. Um, figure out what you're trying to achieve and what's the best way to get to that using the underlying principles of user first and all of the other principles along the way. Great, thanks, Jennifer. Um, thanks, Anneli. Thank uh, Kastub for your input on that. I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, we're running out of time. We've got five minutes left. And then uh, we're going to ask the, all the attendees and the panelists just to answer a quick one question survey. But uh, I think uh, final questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we've got a, a question here that says, most large companies focus on horizontal progression rather than vertical progress, which feeds very well into design thinking. Is there a way in which old ideas can be pivoted to recapture a dwindling customer segment due to growing competitiveness in traditional markets? It's a very extensive question, but uh, Dr. Kastub, uh, anything from your input from your side? Well, uh, see, there is, as uh, Jennifer mentioned uh, just now, a uh, very, very valid point that there's no one way to do things. It is extremely contextual. Uh, so uh, trying to fit everything under one blanket, uh, not possible. So what is the segment that you're looking at? What is the industry that you are looking at? And responding that way uh, is, is what should be done. Having said that, are there some basic principles in which you can uh, kind of differentiate yourself in a crowded market in a dwindling customer segment? Well, I mean, how do you uh, make your product differentiated in terms of what is it that the customer is wanting? So if your user understanding is sharp, maybe you could add some feature in that. Uh, you could add some features, additional features in that. Uh, we have uh, kind of a framework which comprises about 73 features which can be considered uh, as, as, you know, ideal product features. So maybe one can pick up something which the competitor does not have. Uh, there are frameworks there, out there. Uh, some papers uh, can be looked up. Uh, so which feature is not there? Benchmark yourself against competition. That's one way. Then another way you can look at is how do I now minimize my costs if you want to appeal to a broader market segment. Now, in which case, are there any principles to do that? Well, uh, to cut costs, maybe try and identify some 
uh, idle assets in the supply chain who do not have work and who you can use as your vendors to be able to minimize your costs. So that's one way of looking at the whole business model to minimize your costs. Can you look at uh, making uh, your vendor pay you money as well as your customer pay you money? That means can you restructure your business model in such a way that you can make money from both ends of the value chain, so to say. Like for example, uh, if you are in a business where you feel there is some scope for training at some scale, you know, skills training at some scale uh, in the software industry, so to say. So can you start some training academy where students pay you to get trained? And on the other side, customers also pay you to get some systems developed. Now, can you use student interns from your training academy as interns to actually create the systems also, help you create the system also? So you are basically cutting your costs of production by making money from the customer side as well as from your supplier side. So these are some tools, techniques, or rather some, some set ways in which you can explore what works in your context. I, that's really contextual. And especially today, post the pandemic, I see a lot of supply chains which are broken, which means there is a lot of idle capacity which is there in the supply chains, which is not being utilized. Can you creatively utilize those uh, idle capacities in the supply chain to actually lower your prices, but still maintain the same quality. That way you could expand your market base also. This is some things which come to my mind offhand. Open to others, please. Jennifer, anything from your side, any input? That last, that last point is interesting. It, it talks to a lot of the companies in this current pandemic, like SAB or some of the alcohol manufacturers repurposing to make sanitizer. So we can't make beer as much as we were before. Well, let's repurpose our assets to make something else. But I think there are ways to take an old idea and, and recombine it and to say, well, what if we combine this idea with this idea? Or what if we put this solution into this market? What, is it, what does it need to be to, to uh, work for that, that customer segment? Um, so rather than just trying to milk a dead cow, um, try and find some new cows. Very valid. Zanele, your, anything from your side? <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing at the new cow um, <laughs> example. Just to add to what, what Jennifer said, and I won't go too, too far now because we're running out of time, but the, the really great thing about startups is that you've got this nimbleness, this consistent nimbleness. And Dr. Kastub, you spoke earlier in the beginning about how a lot of organizations are experiencing the challenge of decision making that has to has this hierarchical structure where it's not so fluid uh, for decisions to be made. So I think that this is one of the, the really great things about startups that there's this nimbleness and this ability to consistently make decisions at, at a very fast pace. And so experimentation is one thing that I want to strongly advise. But looking at small business units, because the risk is quite high, depending on how you're experimenting and what you're investing into it, the, the risk can be quite high. So I want to just advise something that IBM did, and they called it their EBOs or Emerging Business Opportunities, where they created these smaller business units within the bigger uh, I, uh, IBM frame so that they could experiment, make decisions faster, execute, go out into markets, get feedback, and then actually start production without having to go all the way to the guy right at the top, but make those decisions quite quickly. And to add on to what Jennifer was saying, it's okay. So many organizations have done it. If we look at Coca-Cola, they started as selling pharmaceutical products. Colgate once explored frozen foods. Nokia started as a paper mill. So it happens. And sometimes the company could look completely different from what we know it to be, but that's just the way that this works. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our panelists, to our presenters. Um, thank you very much. And I think thanks to all our attendees. Uh, we had a 138 people attending the seminar. I think that is a great, uh, a, a great attendance number. Um, we're going to close off. And, uh, but before we do, there's a question that we're going to post just for quick uh, 
a survey from all our panelists and our attendees. Please, it's a one question uh, response, guys. So, uh, again, from our side, from the foundation side, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your input. And uh, hopefully, we can do this again. And I believe the, the, the feedback that we've got, there's so many questions coming in. I don't think we're going to have time to answer anything more, but uh, we'll try and uh, revert if possible to perhaps yourselves for some feedback on these questions. But uh, again, thank you. And uh, from my side and everybody else's side, have a great day and hope we can speak again soon. Thanks a lot. Okay. Any final closing from your side, uh, Jennifer Zanele, Dr. Kaustu, any final remarks? No. Just try, just go out there and do something. It's also called design doing because it's not about thinking too much. It's about getting out there and doing something. So do something and then see if it works. Don't, don't let too much analysis lead to paralysis. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Nazane. <laughs> okay. So Namsa, if you can uh, close us off and uh, post the question, then I think uh, we're going to say goodbye. Thank you, everybody, and hope to see you all soon on our next uh, webinar. Can we log out? Uh, we just uh, want to quickly see if we can get the question popped okay. up. Namsa, are you winning? I see she did post the question, but now it's gone all the way up in the chats. The chats have posted it on the chat. Oh, so I've posted it on the chat. So yeah, if you, if any, everybody just give us your feedback on the chat uh, and then uh, I was hoping to have a question that we can pop up on the screen for a quick response. Uh, well, the question was, would you recommend the World Bonny Foundation session to fellow colleagues? And uh, please share with us any other topics of interest for future consideration that we can uh, perhaps host. So uh, we would like your response on that just on the chat webinar. And with that, once you've responded, we're welcome to sign off. Thank you very much. <laughs>